Vile acid test statistics for Scottish Deerhounds on the OFA website, 42 evaluations, all normal. And I understand that you guys are not used to sending in results to the OFA, but, but hopefully when I go through the reasons that, um, that it's helpful if you do report results of your genetic screening, you'll understand how it represents your breed and how it actually helps you as breeders. Okay, there's severe bleeding disorders that all you need is a capillary to pop and, and you get bleeding and it doesn't stop because there's no clotting. That's not what this disease is about. This disease causes oozing. Okay, this disease, if surgery is done, like a spay or a neuter, you get oozing. Okay, or you don't get oozing. So there is variation in how it presents. Not every affected dog will have a bleeding episode, but some do. What percentage of some? We don't know, Dr. Giger doesn't know at Penn, but, but we know that they can, and we know we have a test that can select against it. It's a high carrier frequency from 199 dogs tested. OFA testing only had 24 dogs in the database where you sent in the results. 62.5% normal, 33.3% .3 carrier, eight dogs, 4.2% affected one dog. In spite of the fact that that's very low numbers, those are the exact same ratios that you reported in your health survey. So although neither of them prove that 30% of your dogs are carriers of factor seven, it's starting to tell us a story that makes me start to believe it. So it is something that seems to be a high frequency in the breed. You really need to do a, you know, to be able to take an open database like OFA that has a lot of dogs in there, that has the pedigree database so that you can look at the relationship of dogs and figure out, you know, do certain families bleed more than others? Do um, what percentage of dogs do bleed or don't bleed uh, when they have trauma or surgery? That's the kind of research that needs to be done that you don't have uh, those answers right now. Um, okay, anesthesia reaction, uh, 197 answers, 9% uh, yes had an anesthesia reaction, and the results were all, um, were all listed in the back of the survey on, on uh, part three of the survey on the website. F due to all sorts of different anesthetic agents, anesthetic or sedative protocols, what happened, what didn't happen, and so forth. The bottom line is, and speaking to Dr. Court at Washington State University, who um, studies this disease in your breed, um, is that it's not malignant hyperthermia that your breed has. There is a gene for malignant hyperthermia in some breeds. It has been identified and there's a genetic test for it. Malignant hyperthermia, when these dogs have anesthesia, they, develop, they spike a high, high fever that does not respond to efforts to lower the dog's body temperature. They die because, because you're unable to control that fever and get it back to, to a, a level where they don't die from their brain being fried. Deer hounds respond, okay? It is not malignant hyperthermia. Um, and what he has found is a DNA variant in the RYR1 gene. And he's pretty sure that this is the gene that causes the disease. It's the same gene that's found for this disorder in greyhounds. So it is an anesthesia sensitivity and reaction to anesthesia. And you know, he mentions ketamine and he mentions halothane, which is an inhalant anesthetic that most vets do not use anymore, but some may still use it. Um, that tends to be the most frequent cause of these. But the bottom line is these dogs do respond with high temperatures. They do respond to treatment to lower their temperatures again. Um, no commercial test is yet available, but he hopes to have that done by, um, by the end of this year. So it looks like something that you're going to be able to, to use. He feels it's a very infrequent um, disorder in your breed. We don't know any gene frequencies. The samples that have been sent to him are very biased um, of affected dogs and their close relatives. Um, and if you have a dog that is affected with this, he would like you to, and the email address is, in, is on your website, but he would like you to uh, get a cheek swab kit and send him a cheek swab as well as the veterinary documentation of exactly what happened to your dog, what drugs were used, um, what what therapy was done to, uh, for it to respond to so he can do the best research for you. Hyperfibrinolysis 
is another disease that he is looking at. A big long name. I literally had no, no idea what this was uh, when I called him to ask about it. I felt kind of stupid, but, uh, um, but he did explain it and, and it, is a, it is a process. It is a bleeding disorder where clots break down and cause bleeding two to three days after surgery. So it doesn't cause bleeding during surgery. They clot properly. But in the maturation of that clot, it breaks down too early and it starts the bleeding up again two to three days later instead of just finishing the clot process and drying up and, and having everything all healed up. Um, he feels it's a mutation in a gene that inhibits what's called fibrinolysis. And so, and fibrinolysis is where the clot is, is being lysed or broken down, the fibrin in the clot is being broken down. And so in many processes in the body, you have competing genes. One gene that promotes and one gene that inhibits. And it's those guys in balance that keeps everything working properly. So like with bones, you have genes that control osteoblastosis or the formation of bone. And then you have genes that promote osteoclast um, uh, um, occurrence, which is the breaking down of bone. And so if you have defects in either of those, if you have bone building up, you develop osteoarthritis, you develop exostoses. If you have bone being broken down, you can have OCD. You can have the diseases where you have bone and cartilage um, uh, degeneration going on. So in this case, he feels it's a gene that breaks down the clot um, and that inhibits the breaking down of the clot, and by a mutation in that gene, um, it causes increased breakdown. Um, the function test for this gene uses human reagents, and he's getting weird results that don't correspond to what he thinks they should be getting. And, and he recognizes that the reagents are human reagents, and he feels he needs to develop a test with canine reagents that can properly measure the fibrinolysis of the blood and of the DNA. So he's working on uh, getting a test using canine reagents where he can then test that gene, but he feels he's really onto something where maybe he can get a genetic test for you guys. But he definitely knows that this is also a very rare disease. Is it the most important disease for you guys? No, it's a rare disease. Um, well, one thing he asked for is that he has a lot of samples from affected dogs, um, but he, he needs con more controlled dogs for his research. So he needs dogs that have undergone surgery um, that, uh, and the treatment for this, they respond very, very well to aminocaproic acid, which is very expensive, but now uh, uh, tranexamic acid, which is relatively inexpensive, uh, can prevent this whole um, process. Um, and so many people use these drugs um, post-surgically uh, in order to prevent bleeding um, if they feel their dogs might be at risk. And if the dogs do have bleeding, they use these drugs to treat them and they get the bleeding stops and they get better. So he needs dogs that underwent surgery that were not given these drugs prophylactically and that, and, uh, that never bled after major surgery. And if you have a dog like that, again, contact his email, it's on the website, and he wants DNA from your dog um, uh, for the control group. Um, lastly, drug reaction, 177 answers, yes, 6%, and there was a myriad of different drugs that, that different dogs may have reacted to or may have not reacted to. So um, it's, uh, it, it's a tough one to say, do you have drug reactivity? But you don't have the MDR1 gene um, and, and some of the other genes that cause drug reactions that he has run, uh, your breed does not have that either. Lastly, hairlessness in Scottish Deerhounds. They just found the gene for this. It's an autosomal recessive uh, gene. The research was done in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, they were working at this in, at the Broad as well. Um, now they're working at this. NIH. Yes, at NIH, at NIH. Um, um, but uh, Helsinki scooped them and published it first. Um, they studied two affected litter mates and compared them to 64 unaffected but probably related dogs um, and found this to be a simple autosomal recessive disorder 
and they found a 12% carrier frequency from those 66 dogs that they studied. That was a very biased sample. In all likelihood, the carrier frequency is not 12%. You won't know until, until more people do testing from across the breadth of your gene pool, but it's, it's not a fatal disease. Um, it, uh, it causes hair loss, and, uh, um, but it is something that you certainly don't want in your deer hounds and something you can probably select against. So this was just published also in March of this year. So I want to go through a couple of quick things. Hip dysplasia, there are only 22 hip radiographs on deer hounds in the OFA database. Um, going back to the, when they started in the 60s, only one deer hound has been submitted to the OFA since 1995. So you guys are not, if you're not doing hip x-ray, if you're doing hip x-rays, you're not submitting to OFA, and, and it doesn't seem like you are doing hip x-rays. Um, you've got excellence, you've got goods, you've got some fares. Um, there weren't any dysplastics reported, but out of 22 radiographs, I'm not sure what that tells us um, in that. Um, elbow dysplasia, three evaluations, all normal. Hypothyroidism, 88 deer hounds have been tested by Michigan State University. 4.5% are positive for thyroglobulin um, autoantibodies. The average for all breeds is 7.5%. 7.7% um, of 13 tested in the OFA database are positive for autoantibodies. So this disease does occur at a low level in your breed. I'm not gonna go through all of the hypothyroid stuff with you. Eye registry. Um, six deer hounds have been examined by a boarded ophthalmologist since, since 2013 to 2018. And it's not six dogs that you guys had their eyes checked and sent in the, the OFA form or the old SURF form. It's six dogs because the OFA exams now cover every single examination that an ophthalmologist does on a dog, whether in a clinic whether in their hospital, whether, you know, whether, you know, as an ophthalmologist, they see patients all day long, they are, they are filling out a form for every dog that they see all day long, every day. So it isn't just what you send in. Six deer hounds have been screened since 2013. Okay, you guys are not screening eyes. Um, and then lastly, degenerative myelopathy. It's a loss of neurological function. Uh, the bottom line is there's a mutation in the, in the SOD1 gene that must be homozygous recessive for a dog to become affected with degenerative myelopathy. The SOD1 mutation is the most common mutation across all purebred and mixed breed dogs. It is an extremely common muta mutation. 7.8% of all mixed breed dogs and 5.4% of all purebred dogs carry that mutation. It has been identified in almost all dog breeds, most of which have never had a diagnosis of degenerative myelopathy. A definitive diagnosis requires a histopathological diagnosis. It cannot be diagnosed in a live dog, regardless of MRI or electromyograms or any other uh, test in a, in a live dog. And that histopathology must be done by a researcher that is used to diagnosing degenerative myelopathy, not just spinal cord degeneration. Um, no deer hound has ever been diagnosed with DM. It is not a relevant disease in the breed. There is no reason to do SOD1 testing. There is no reason to select against carriers or homozygous dogs with the SOD1 mutation in the deer hound breed. It, does not, it is not a disease-related breed, uh, related gene in your breed or in most of the breeds that are out there. Some breeds like the wire fox terrier have a 92% um, sodomum mutation frequency. Only 8% of the genes out of all gene pairs in that breed are the normal gene. Degenerative myelopathy does not exist in that breed. And in many breeds that is the exact situation going on. And people are, are decimating their breeds by selecting against it because the Mars panel test and the Embark test says my dog is a carrier of degenerative myelopathy. I must select against it. I must spay and neuter. And it's the exact worst thing to do because it's not properly interpreting and utilizing the results of that test. So let's talk a little bit about responsibility, about breeding. We've got a half hour to go. What is the definition of responsibility in the, in the dictionary? Duty, obligation, burden. 
what is the obligation for breeders to do genetic testing? Breeders are the custodians of their breeds and their gene pool. As physicians and veterinarians, we take a Hippocratic oath that says, above all, do no harm. If we are treating a patient, we need to try to make them better. But above all, do not make them worse, okay? So as breeders, we need to improve our breed with our breedings. If we ignore health, we are making our breeds more unhealthy. And that is against what we need to be doing. So we need to use genetic tests for the best interests of our breeds. We need to use the tests that are valid tests for valid diseases in our breeds, but we must use it in a way that helps our breed and doesn't hurt our breed. What is the expectation of the general public? So this, at one point I Googled general public under, under Google images and I came up with this picture and I have no idea why. <laughs> but the expectation of the general public is that the quality control for genetic disease is being done. The public expects good breeders to be doing health testing and selection for genetic health. And we're not doing that. And breeders in general are not doing that. It's the ethical responsibility and obligation of all breeders to perform the available required pre-breeding health tests on prospective breeding stock prior to any breeding. And here is a, if you do an OFA test, so let me let you in on something, because most of you have never done an OFA test and submitted to OFA, you'll get this little bumper sticker type thing. It's not really for a bumper, but we see it on a lot of tack, tack boxes and, uh, and things like that. Health tested parents for healthier puppies. The only way you'll get healthier puppies is if you health test your parents for the diseases that are specific to your breed. All genetic disease cannot be prevented. However, we have the knowledge and the tools to improve the genetic health of puppies. So who is a responsible breeder? It is one that does the proper genetic testing. And, and we'll get into what's proper for your breed because it's obvious you don't test for some things at all and you do test for other things and we'll talk about that. But the bottom line is you need to test for the appropriate stuff. And if you're not gonna do that, you need to find a different hobby or profession where you can actually do a good job because you're not doing a good job if you're not doing the proper genetic screening for a deer hound. Many health tests can be performed during an examination with your veterinarian or obtained inexpensively at local health screening clinics. And the OFA has on their website um, health screening clinics and it tells you, you know, where they are, what's being tested for, who's doing the testing, what the costs are. But the best website, if you want to go to a clinic where you can get, you know, all your you know, testing done all in one place, go to the CavalierHealth.org website. This is in the handout here. They list every single uh, health test, um, health screening clinic in, North, in Canada and in the United States and exactly what tests are done and how much it costs and so it's an excellent resource. So managing genetic disease. Let's talk about the different types of genetic diseases and how we manage them. Dominant genes are easy to control because if you have a completely penetrant dominant gene, if the dog has the gene, they'll have the disease. So it's easy to control if it's completely penetrant. If you have a late onset dominant, where the dog doesn't become affected, if there's no test for it and the dog doesn't become affected until after its breeding age, then half of its offspring will also get that disease and become affected. So you ideally don't want to breed and produce more affected dogs. And so with dominant genes, this is one of the few times where my recommendation is not breed that quality dog and Okay, this is where you need to not breed that dog and breed a close relative that does not carry that gene that can therefore carry forth your um, family lines in your breeding program that you want, but not necessarily the exact dog that you wanted to breed. So in this example of a late onset disease, this male was the breeding dog. He produced two litters um, before he came down and was affected. Um, now we have a genetic test for this disease. Um, does his sire have se stored semen, his normal sire? Are the bitches, his litter mates that are clear, available for breeding? 
to lease or to breed? Are his prior born offspring, is there semen or are they available to breed? So you want to use all the good genes that he's passing on, but lose that one gene in that generation. With recessive genes, if you have a test for carriers, and this is where it's really important because you not now have some tests for carriers. You've got factor seven. Um, you're probably gonna have genes for anesthesia reaction. You'll have genes for hairlessness and those types of things. Um, you want to breed carriers to genetically normal mates, quality carriers. If it's a quality dog, and you already decided this dog is of quality that I'm considering for him for breeding, him or her, and therefore I'm gonna be a conscientious breeder, I'm gonna do my genetic testing, and then you get back that test result and it says carrier. Emotionally, you're gonna say, I can't breed this dog, it's a carrier. It's no longer the perfect dog I thought, think it was. I think less of this dog now because of this carrier status than I did and was excited about this dog before I knew that it was a carrier. That is the, the absolute opposite response that you should have, okay? We have a testable gene. We breed our quality carrier to a normal. We replace our quality carrier with a, normal, with a quality normal testing offspring. We lose that gene in one generation and carry on that line in that breeding program that we've been working on uh, for the things that we love and we love to have sleeping on our beds at night. Not sure. You guys, do your dogs sleep? You have big beds? Is that it? Okay, all right. I, I just wanted to make sure about that. Um, but you do want to select against carriers for breeding because carrier to normal produces 50% carrier. You don't want to raise the frequency of carriers in the population. So you want to limit the number of carriers you're putting into breeding homes. Um, and, but you don't want to lose those quality dogs that are carriers. <laughs> if the best offspring that that dog produces is better than that dog but is also a carrier, well, you've improved the quality in that generation. Maybe the next generation, you lose that gene with a quality offspring. You never produce affecteds, and you try to lose that gene um, through breeding. If everyone decides not to breed carriers, it can have a significant limiting effect on the gene pool. Um, if the breeder was planning on breeding that dog, the proper response is still to breed it with a testable gene. Each individual is not an eye, a hip, or a heart. Each individual carries tens of thousands of genes. You must consider all aspects, health, confirmation, temperament, working ability, uh, and making breeding decisions based on a single testable gene is inappropriate. For recessive diseases, a direct genetic test does not alter who gets bred, only who they get bred to. This is a quote from Dr. Paula Henthorne at UPenn, who does all the cystinuria research. It's a phenomenal quote. So let's talk about genetic registries. Uh, so the OFA used to be the Orthopedic Foundation for Animals, and it's now the OFA Canine Health Information Center. And I just want to show you real quick the website, because it has changed a lot. And, uh, and if you haven't been on it lately, you should go back and see it. So we, we changed the website about two years ago now. Okay, so here we go, health tested parents for healthier puppies. Right up here, you can type in the registered registration number or name of any dog and immediately look up a dog that way. Um, and it's any registry, even, you know, even foreign registries or even UKC or, or anything. If a dog has been tested and its data is in the database, it'll show up. Or you can do an advanced search. An advanced search is a, it's a hugely powerful search engine for you to deal with. So with an advanced search, you can search based on breed. You want to look just at deer hounds. You can look at the results of any tests that you want that are in the OFA database. You could look up um, what types of results of those tests that you want. Um, and, and so there's all sorts of things that you can look for when you're looking to select for, for possible mates if the information is in the OFA website. If you're not sending it to OFA, you can't utilize the power of that website to help identify individuals that have test results. So that's a big reason why it's important to get test results in the OFA websites. So you can use it as that tool. And then you can also 
be able to use the website to look at the statistics. So right here you can say, what are the health statistics for my breed? And so you click read the statistics and you click on deer hounds and it lists every single test that has ever been done on a deer hound and it's in the OFA website, what those results are and so forth. So you can look at the statistics for all the different diseases by breed. There's a lot of other things on the website here. We have great articles on how to utilize um, testing for, for things. We have breed health surveys. I would recommend that you have a breed health survey up on the OFA website. OFA will work with you to, um, to make that, that health survey specific to your breed, ask the questions that you want to ask, um, break down the answers the way you want it broken down and then it's a live survey and it's a perpetual survey that continually gets answered and then if you want to break it down by, by five year periods or by birth dates or any other statistical analysis that you want to do on that data, OFA will work on you to be able to break that data down. But it gives you an answer and it also gives you not so much your breed where you are controlling most of the breeding um, and there isn't a lot of commercial breeding going on, but it does get the pet owners involved as well if you can talk to them about, about getting results. So lots of good stuff on the OFA website. The Chick DNA Repository is where all the DNA comes from for the research that needs to be done in your breed. And you guys, especially with the leadership of your health committee, um, does a great job collecting DNA at the specialties. You've got 335 Scotch Deerhound deer uh, DNA samples in the repository, um, almost all of them blood samples which is the most important thing. Because with a blood sample, they could send DNA on, on each dog to the factor seven research, to the osteosarcoma research. They have enough DNA where they could send that, that sample out 10, 20 different times and still have enough DNA left over for more research. So, so whereas a cheek swab has a limited amount of DNA. So, um, and, 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 and the OFA is really, really diligent about not using up all the DNA on dogs so that, so that uh, if they only need a, a portion and some dogs have been depleted by certain studies, they'll look to other dogs that are, um, that are falling into the categories that the researchers are asking for and getting blood from those. And if the researcher needs fine tuning, then go to some of those other samples. We're, they're really frugal about your samples. And those samples are owned by you Okay, they're being held by the OFA, but if a new test comes along for a dog that is deceased um, and you want to know if a foundation dog of your breeding program carried a certain gene, you just contact the OFA and you say, I want that DNA sent to this lab to be tested for that gene and OFA will work to, to get that done for you so you can test that dog because it's your dog and your DNA. All right. And you can send um, uh, straws uh, of semen of really poor quality or dead semen from some of your dogs if you've got some poor quality straws to the chick repository if you have a deceased dog but frozen semen um, that is poor quality or that you're not going to use and get that dog into the DNA repository as well. Works just as well as blood, gets just as much DNA and it's a perfect way to add. The Canada Health Information Center is a standard of care in health conscious breeding. It's an open health database for breeds. Included disorders and means of diagnoses are determined by each national parent club. And the beauty of the chick program is animals receive chick certification based on completing the required genetic testing as determined by your parent club, regardless of abnormal or normal results. So chick is not about health perfection. Chick is about um, about uh, um, covering the bases so that it's health consciousness. So showing you're a health conscious breeder. If your dog has a chick number, it means you're a health conscious breeder. And that's how you can show your puppy buyers that you are a health conscious breeder by chick numbers on your dogs. So for the Scottish Deerhounds, your club has determined that the testable disorders that they want you to do are a cardiac evaluation, and, uh, and a uh, echocardiogram, a factor seven deficiency test, and a bile acid test for liver shunt. And that's what your breed club has decided um, is required for chick certification. And also for chick certification, you have to sign off to release that information uh, um, into the open database. So even if it has abnormal results, you need to have those abnormal results reported 
on the database. So it, it's about open reporting and health consciousness. 22 Scottish deer hounds have achieved chick certification in the lifetime of the OFA database by testing for those three things. So again, you're not doing these tests or at least not submitting to the OFA. So, and I, when I talk to the public and I talk to people, we talk about chick ratios. And a chick ratio is the percentage of your breed that has been bred, okay? And versus the percentage that has been chick certified and had their numbers done. And your chick ratio is 0.1%. Okay, so it's a tenth of 1% of the deer hounds that have been bred have been chick certified. So there's a disconnect there. And is the disconnect that your chick requirements are not really what the requirements should be for a breeding deer hound? Or is, or is it that you do your testing but you just don't send them into OFA? Or is it that you don't do the testing? You know, I do think it's probably the middle answer to some extent. I think it's the first answer to some extent as well. I don't know that every deer hound needs a bile acid test because the bile acid test is a real wonky test and doesn't often give you the exact results that you think that it's giving you. So maybe it should be a recommended test, but not necessarily a required test for every deer hound. So these are things that you need to consider. But I think you need to show a, um, show a philosophy of health screening by whatever tests you do do through the OFA to show the public that your breed is health conscious, that you are doing genetic screening, because right now it looks like your breed is not doing genetic screening and is not a health conscious breed. And I know that you guys are because of all the work that you do, but I think, I think you need to demonstrate it a little bit more and it's not expensive to do that for these once in a lifetime tests. And to register a test result on a breeding dog one time for $15 is not an enormous thing to ask in that regard. Um, so here, for the bottom one third of, of, of dogs, AKC breeds and population, here are the chick ratios. Irish Water Spaniel has a chick ratio of 1.4. 40% more dogs are complete their chick testing in Irish Water Spaniels than are bred. Okay, and then you can see the other breeds that do a lot of testing. Welsh Springers at, uh, at 50%, Glen of Amal Terriers, Sesky Terriers, Otter Hounds, Pharaoh Hounds, Curly Coated Retrievers, Pumies. So these are the dogs that are carrying the candle for health conscious breeding and health testing by showing that they have high chick ratios. Whether you're doing health conscious breeding or not, we don't know because it's not reflected in your chick ratio. The average for the bottom one-third population of breeds, the average chick ratio is 16%, not 0.1%. Uh, bred by heart is the AKC's um, uh, health testing requirements um, for their program. Um, uh, and you have listed factor seven cardiac and bile acids. So the same thing you have for your chick requirements. Most breeds, they, those do parallel each other. I want to show you one I want to show you one um, OFA page on a deer hound. And the reason I picked this deer hound is for a couple of reasons. The dog's name is uh, Kylikin Peregrine Falcon. Anyone hear of this dog? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, female born in 2005. So I use this dog for a reason. Uh, first of all, she's chick she has her chick number as noted by the chick next to her name. Okay, she has her picture on her web page, and the picture costs a $10 donation to the AKC Canine Health Foundation Scottish Deerhound Donor Advised Fund. So that's money that's only going to deerhound research as directed by your club. A $10 donation that you make to OFA gets passed on to the Scottish Deerhound Donor Advised Fund. You get your dog's picture. This is your dog's Facebook page. This is Facebook for dogs, okay? It has your dog, it has their information, has all the tests they have done, has DNA in the DNA bank, has a bile acid test, has a nitroprusside test, normal, negative, clear for factor seven, um, normal cardiac exam by a practitioner, normal echo, um, chick qualified, and normal eye exam. 
It then goes down and shows you both parents were also CHIC certified. It shows that both parents had cardiac, um, has DNA in the bank, factor seven testing, and the sire had a nitroprusside test. Um, it shows the full siblings um, to this dog and their test results. It shows the half siblings through the sire. It shows the half siblings through the dam and all of their test results. With complexly inherited disease, you need to know what the test results of the relatives of your dogs are in order to know the risk of your dogs carrying liability genes for those diseases. If you go up here to vertical pedigree and we click vertical pedigree, it then lists all of the diseases that it can give you a vertical pedigree for in a deer hound, a nitroprusside test, cardiac, factor seven, bile acids. If we do cardiac, it will now show you the pedigree of Peregrine Falcon. She's normal, she has four siblings that are normal, and zero offspring that have been tested and in the OFA database. Sire normal, one sibling normal, 19 offspring, nine normal, one abnormal. So only, only 10 offspring have had the results, um, have had the hearts done uh, and in the OFA database. Dam normal, siblings, offspring, grandparents, siblings, offspring, all the depth and breadth of pedigree that you need to know to be able to know the risk of your dogs being a um, liability for developing heart disease in your breed. So it's very important in that regard. But what's missing from those results? All normals. It's real nice having all normals on your dog's web page, but it doesn't help you unless you know where the abnormals are as well. And that's where the importance of open health reporting comes in. We don't have tests for cardiomyopathy. We don't have tests for osteosarcoma. We don't even have a database for osteosarcoma because you can't examine a dog and declare it normal. Okay, same thing with bloat. You can't examine a dog and call it normal for bloat unless it bloats. But you need to create databases that report who bloated, who has osteosarcoma, who developed cardiomyopathy with validated veterinarian, uh, with veterinarian validation so that you then can look at the risk of your own dogs and the dogs that you're looking to breed to. Breeding blindly is not a fun thing to do. And breeding with education and with knowledge allows you to improve what you have and go in directions that you want to go if the data is there. So it's important we start reporting abnormals. Um, I'm not gonna do that one. Um, open health reporting, we, we check on hips and report out to their breeds what percentage they report for, uh, to the open health database release of abnormal results. Even if it's a normal hip radiograph, if the owner has signed off for release of abnormal results, what percentage is reported? Well, of the 22 hips that have been sent into OFA, 0% did you check off for open health reporting. Not that that gives us a big sample or a big number, but the average for all breeds is 23%. And some breeds have over 30 to 40 percent where they have a, a, a climate of reporting and, and a climate of open reporting of abnormal results. And if we're talking to each other about these things, that's when it, it really helps. As long as we keep problems secret, we will not be able to deal with them. Breeders need to be informed about the problems occurring in the offspring that they produce. The days of stigmatizing conscientious health testing breeders have, who have produced dogs affected or carrying hereditary disease are over. And I know that that's a pie in the sky statement because it still does happen. But the bottom line is the stigma now falls on those of you that are not reporting. Because if someone breeds a dog and then it develops osteosarcoma and then you find out, well, the the, the father of that stud dog you bred to had osteosarcoma or the full sibling had cardiomyopathy, then like what, you know, you're telling me this now, why do I find this out now after I've produced it when I could have bred better by l looking to work away from something? And that's, that's why we need to help each other and report this information. The stigma lies with those of us that hide it now, not those of us that report it. So direct gene tests, all you need to know is a test of your own dog. If you don't have direct gene tests, if you have only phenotypic tests or linkage tests or no tests for carrier, knowledge of the carrier and affected status of the, of the um, 
of the relatives is important. Okay, I'm going to go a little faster to finish things up so we don't run over um, by too much. Without tests for carriers, you want to breed higher risk dogs to lower risk dogs. And I'm going to skip through relative risk assessment because it has a whole explanation. But the bottom line is those vertical pedigrees in your, on the OFA website, if you had all that information, would tell you who has higher risk. And if it's a quality dog with higher risk, you breed it to a dog with lower risk. So that's relative risk analysis. We're not going to go through that today. It's in your handout. Sex-linked genes uh, are carried on the X chromosome. Uh, males can be affected. Uh, for females to be affected, they had to have an affected father. So, um, so the bottom line with X-linked is if you don't have a test for carrier, if you use a normal male, um, then, then you, will not, you will lose that, uh, that gene. And lastly, complexly inherited diseases. You want to look at the phenotypic traits that are tied to that disease. Um, breadth of pedigree gives you more information than, than depth of pedigree. You want to treat disorders as threshold traits where several genes have to add up to cross a threshold. And you want to breed normal dogs from mostly normal litters. It's 9.31, but within five minutes I'll be finished, so I apologize for that. So depth of pedigree is what we normally do. We say three generations free of X disease, whether it's hips or osteosarcoma or whatever. Um, you know, the parents and the grandparents, none of them had this disease. But the bottom line is with complex inherited disease, the breadth of pedigree, the litter mates to our dogs, the litter mates to the parents of our dogs, tell us more information about what genes can be carried by our dogs than just the parents and the grandparents. So if a dog is clear, and, and its litter mates had a were all clear or had a preponderance of being normal, is much more important than a dog who did not have the disease or is clear, but has a lot of the disease in its litter mates. So that dog has a, a high chance of carrying liability genes, and you need to question what genes they are passing on. Polygenic disorders are threshold traits where several traits must, must add up together to cross a threshold. If we say theori theoretically it causes five genes to cause a disease, and a dog that has the disease has seven genes and is bred to another dog where the average between them is close to that threshold is a seven, we can't be surprised when you see disease being produced. And not that we have genes to measure those threshold genes, but, but we know that what we can figure out the risk based on um, the relatives. But the other takeaway with threshold traits is that if you have two normal dogs that were screened and were phenotypically normal, and you breed them together, and they produce an affected dog, both parents had to contribute liability genes to cause that affected individual. It wasn't just that damn stud dog that you've read to, okay? Both parents. Now, one, one parent may, may have a greater risk of liability genes and pass on a greater percentage, and you would figure that out through depth and breadth of pedigree by looking at that vertical pedigree to find out that information. And this is a very busy figure, but it's in an article that's on the OFA website where we looked at half a million dogs across all breeds that had an OFA evaluation where both parents also had OFA evaluations. And it plotted the rating on the dam from an excellent being one to a severely dysplastic being seven versus excellent being one and severe being seven of the sire. And then the combined parent score, two Eklunds was a two, whereas two Severs was a 14. A fair to an excellent was a four, but a good to a good was also four. And when you added all these up, they all correlated directly together. So when we plotted out the combined parent score on all of the dogs, it was almost completely linear. Hip dysplasia is a completely additive disease based on OFA ratings. So there's a difference between a fair and a good and an excellent. And if you're trying to select for better hips, or if you're trying to select for better anything with complex disease, the amount or of liability that's there um, definitely has to do with the amount of liability genes. The only outlier here was severely dysplastic to moderately dysplastic, and there were only 50 dogs there, whereas there were a quarter of a million dogs with good to good producing, um, producing a four. 
And when we add the number of normal grandparents into the mix of these combined parent scores, the more normal grandparents that you have, adding the, the depth of pedigree gives you even greater control against the, a complex lean header disease. So in closing, breeders should use health screening tests to identify carriers or risk of carrying disease liability genes, work to breed away from the defective genes, and prevent the reintroduction of genes in future matings. Everyone's gonna have a different thing that they're dealing with. Some of you may be dealing more with osteosarcoma. Some of you might be dealing more with bloat. Some of you might be dealing more with other things, as well as the quality issues. You know, some of you are just not getting that top line or the tail set or whatever else, and other people seem to get it no matter who they breed to. And, and so everyone's got different goals and different things that you need to concentrate on and different things you need to concentrate on with each mating. You need to decide what are my top three or four things I want from this mating, not the top 10 things. Because if you're selecting for 10 things, you're not going to get any of them. Whereas if you select for just a few things that are, e that are easier or harder to get, you actually want to attack the harder ones first because it'll take you several generations to correct them. The simple one gene things you can correct in one generation. Okay, so you need to think about all of those types of things. Each breeder must assess their own breeding stock and determine their own rate of progress, replace carriers with normal testing offspring, decrease the carrier frequency or carrier risk with each generation. A healthy breeding does not continually multiply carriers, it does not limit the genetic diversity of the population, and is geared towards producing quality, genetically normal dogs. Lastly, how can we educate the public? because the public is the engine that drives dog breeding, unfortunately. It isn't just the people you're selling dogs to, but the public demands dogs, and maybe not so much Scottish Deerhounds coming from other sources and commercial breeding, but many, many other dogs. If someone contacts you and you don't have a litter, why don't you spend a little bit of time talking to them about what they should be looking for in a health conscious breeder and what questions they should be asking a breeder um, when they're looking to buy a, a puppy so they can understand what their choices are in trying to leverage themselves to having a healthier dog, able to discern responsible health conscious breeders and knowledgeable about genetic testing. And I went over by seven minutes, I apologize, but that is the, uh, the talk for tonight. I will entertain questions if any of you have to leave. I do understand that. If you want to ask a question on the poll anonymously, I will answer some of that as well. But thank you very much for your, um, for your attention tonight.